so so here's a way that I sometimes think about like yoga text, ancient yoga text. Remember, and also maybe what they're trying to do. Remember, they're actually um, trying to pass something down. They're actually trying to communicate. So often we, in which is good in our humbleness, like we actually think of that somehow they're like gatekeepers and, you know, like the, the text themselves or a tough philosophical line. And, and, and it's like they, they're, they're actually, you have to be worthy in order to understand them. Guess what? No, no author writes things down unless you're maybe James Joyce and very, very wanting to be in love with his own ego, right? Um, uh, that's my opinion, right? Um, no writer is writing anything down so nobody can read it or so nobody can can actually receive the wisdom of it, right? And fundamentally, so the yogis are trying to get across that you're unified with your experience even though your world may appear differently, even though your life may appear differently. At the deepest level, they're trying to say that, and I think this is, again, maybe a little bit of an overstatement, that's an illusion. That the unity is actually the reality and the, li the, 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 the living, the way that the world appears is actually not at the same quality of truth or same depth as truth as the interconnectedness, right? And it's like, and so like just for a second, without it just being in your mind, this is what I think is so powerful about asana. What if that were true? Like just let, let the truth of it be true, not just the intellectual part of it. What would that feel like? And when, when you start trying to put yourself in what you imagine to be an author's shoes, you're starting to do exactly what the author intended, right? Is for you to take and get the wisdom of what's being communicated. And by the way, I don't know, I only can speak about myself as an author. I have no idea. I'm not fully in control of what I've written. It's for you to explore into it, right? So, all this to say, so like when you think about the eight limbs of yoga, I've said this many times, you know, there's asana, pranayama, um, um, the yamas and niyamas, there's concentration, there's dharma or purpose, there's samadhi, there's, um, um, what's the, um, pratyahara, right? They're just attempts to communicate something um, that's basically unsayable. It doesn't happen in words. So they develop an experiential curriculum, hoping that you might let it in, right? So let's just start from that, okay? Like they're actually just trying to actually open a door and communicate something that they want us to understand right and they're hoping that that they will and you know so this is going to be a big switch now and we're about to start doing asana again um i remember early on in my yoga practice my yoga teacher saying um sometimes you have to do asana as if you're just making brush strokes right okay so and yet the Iyengar method, the one I'm training in that you get access to, is very precise, okay? And, and fills in the picture, the, the precision fills in the picture of the brushstrokes, of the bigger thing. And so for me, I've always thought what she meant was something like Matisse, and you've actually, and I've referred to multiple times, I think, over the years, the Matisse. The drawing of the dancer by the ballerina or dancer, I think it's dancer by Matisse. It just did a few brushstrokes, 
right? And so, so, so I think about, huh, what about my outer edges? What about, isn't it amazing that you can be drawing a line and then pause it and drawing again and your mind will actually fill in the space between the two lines? That in fact, your mind is constantly like filling in the gaps of our experience. So one of the reasons why Matisse's paintings are so great, especially his drawings, are because he's just putting enough on the, on the canvas for your mind to actually fill in the story, right? Like it's, it's genius. When he's, when, and, and some of Picasso's drawings are also really simple like that. They're recognizing that the mind fills in the gaps or when Picasso puts a bicycle seat and handlebars into a museum and calls it a bull. You guys know this famous sculpture he did, right? Oh. My, and, and it totally upended all of what goes in it into an art museum, right? Because it was literally junk handlebars and a junk bicycle seat. And you can see and feel the bull. Like it was like him getting that, that, that place where your mind fills in what's missing, right? And so this is a huge capacity of human consciousness, right? And the yogis are often trying to get it. So, so when I think about this, my yoga teacher saying this to me, she, she says, you know, I think about, well, what if yoga really is infinite in every direction? So these are the kind of things that unfortunately my mind rattles around with, right? And I sit there and think, okay, if it's infinite in every direction, I just got to take that on faith. I'm not even sure what the hell that means, right? but I'm willing to like literally receive what I know is going on in what they're trying to communicate. Where is the terminus of my body? Where does my yoga poses end when my, when my body's moving? Where do they actually begin? Have you noticed how inward I want the beginning of your movements to be? So we'll go through a lot of centering and I'll say like where, where, like, before you so allow 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 because i'm often trying to get you at a to a different place so you can see i've even talked about this with pranayama about like the breath actually like comes in from nothingness into movement if you notice in my language i've been consistently exploring and trying to help you to feel that maybe the beginnings are deeper and less tangible than you think. I also often am telling you to extend, right? Down through the floor, up through the ceiling, right? Because I'm taking seriously that there are only brushstrokes, right? That there's, so, so where are the, so this idea of the outer tips of your body. So one of the real practical ways that asana is very powerful is that it gets, especially elderly people, to move to the outer edges of their body. Over time, your life force will pull away from the periphery and go towards the center midline. And I'm pretty sure it'll exit out through the back body. Right? I'm pretty sure that happens. And that's part of why we end up having our posture go this way and the shoulders to roll forward because it's going this way. But I don't know, who the hell knows, right? So sit up straight and tall. So you know often I'm, I'm cueing the spaces around your body, right? So remember, because I'm not exactly sure where the brush strokes start and where they end. So when Matisse draws a brush stroke on the canvas, even though it comes into form in one place, I swear to God, you can feel the swoosh before the brush stroke and beyond the brush stroke, the brush stroke. So sit and feel for a second. Allow, you've heard me say things like, locate yourself in the room, but I don't mean by judgment. I mean like through your skin. Right, like, 
like fear. And I'll, I'll say things like open to what's above you, below you, on the side of you, and about below. And especially I'll talk about what's behind you. Open up the space, receive the space on the other side of the line right? The line being your body, right? And then you'll hear instructions like this, especially relevant for me because I tilt my head because of my scoliosis. Open to the spaces below your ear and your shoulder. In other words, balance your head over your neck. So BKS Angar will say things like all knowledge enters through the skin right? Intelligence enters through the skin. So I'm going to take that seriously and try to feel the skin on my face, the skin on my neck. What's even harder for me is to feel the skin on my legs, on the soles of my feet, right? Remember, my mind will fill in the gaps because that's what it does. So, and I'm not imagining the feeling of the skin on my feet. Turns out that your nervous system is more integrated than you think. So I'm seriously allowing, which is part of what the yogis want you to do. I want you to allow so much, I want that your brain to recede from the inner edges of your skull. I don't know how to tell you how to do that. I just want you to do it. Remember last week I was talking about stopping the job and even emptying your nasal passages, right? Letting the empty, because I was talking about pranayama, the empty nasal passages, the softening around the eyes and the space, the empty space on each side of my neck between my ears and my shoulders. Are you sure you know where the line begins and ends? But now here comes asana. I want you to feel your sitting bones, staying open to the spaces, to the balance, right? To what's behind you, your feet on the floor. In other words, from Matisse's brush strokes, every painting starts with a drawing, right? And the painting fills it in. So asana is filling in. And I've been trying to tell you that it aims for congruence. So now I'm going to give direction instead of just allowing, I'm going to hit down with my sitting bones and lift my chest up slightly. And I'm going to broaden the space between my shoulder blades and I'm going to feel each sitting bone, but I'm going to drop the inner upper groin down. That's why I tell you to extend the inner groin to the inner knee down to the inner heel because I want you to like have definition inside of a boundary that isn't exactly clear. We know that our boundary isn't clear when we get into bed and don't move, right? We're actually connected to the space around us. That's the core insight and it doesn't change ultimately if even while i'm efforting that's asana feel full and rich and grounded and empty feel where your shoulder tips are the bottoms of your feet to let in what surrounds you. Direct the energy in your spine to fill the vessel. Let go of your day. Prepare your mind to do yoga.
both feel your boundary and feel the whole room. They are the same. Good, and then release. Activate by lifting your sternum. Be in awe when you drop your chin. Feel the strength of your rib cage, the grounding of your sitting bones and inner heels. But do it so you can feel beyond your rib cage into the room, not just from your mind, not just from the organs of perception, but from your experience. Raise your head up with closed eyes, open your eyes. I remember for me, it was a big, big part of my journey when I actually said, well, what if I take some of these lines and actually just assume they're true? <laughs> Then you follow Goethe, who says, you know, live into your questions, right? Don't look for answers. Live into the questions. Live into the lines that have been communicated and trying to pass things down. If you can, put your hands together in prayer. So, and if you can't, just put your hands down on your thighs or, right, get grounded, right? And so I'm just, so I have a hard time balancing the way I want. <clears throat> so I'm leaning back more in my chair and I have both my hands forward, right? Because what I can tell when I'm off balance is I collapse right here, right? And I don't want that, right? So everyone roll your shoulders back, get open here. Remember I talked a lot, this is for pranayama too, that this part of your chest, BKS Angar, who knows more than will ever know about asana, says this is where the energy comes from. So if my hands are in front of me and I'm dropping here, I'm working against myself, right? So I'm getting farther leaning back so I can have, but I want the heel of my hands or the heel of my hands on, the, on, the, on your legs to support the lift right here. I'm gonna to try to integrate. So to me, that means I have to make my elbows heavier and lift my sternum up, right? And ground my feet and soften my jaw and bring in the space that's right around my head into the focal point of my spine. What if all the energy is coming in and coming up through my spine like a fountain? Oh my goodness, what if that's true? What if I give direction through my actions to what's happening. So I'm gonna not just connect the heel of my hands, I'm gonna spread my palm. I'm gonna watch how I'm gonna wanna drop right here, but I'm gonna lift instead. I'm gonna drop my shoulder blades. I'm gonna stay connected. But now it's like, wait, where are my sitting bones and where are my feet? Where is the sensation of my skin? in relationship to this focus? Where is my awareness of the room in relationship to this focus? Taking on faith that the yogis are saying, there is no distinction, even though my mind actually experiences a distinction. So Patanjali will say, quiet down your stupid mind. the blocking organ. The mind blocks, narrows experience. Doesn't open it. Good, and then release. So because, <clears throat> because I actually can't feel my legs as well as you can, one of my warm ups all the time is often and to start the direction of my empty space, right? Because I already know that asana is the combination of effort and empty space. And 
I also know that one of the limbs that these people what, tried to pass down to us was Pratyahara, withdraw from the senses, but asana is going to start to give that stuff direction, right? So I'm going to take my hands on the front of my knees, and I'm going to articulate my femur bone back into my hip socket. And I'm going to start to notice the lift, not just in my chest, because that's the easy lift, right? That's the obvious one, because in order to push back on my knees, my shoulder blades are having to engage, right? But I want to get the lift and the separation between my very low waist and my legs. The paradox of that is to get the separation between my legs and my very low waistline is that I need to hit down with my sitting bones. I actually need more boundary. And then I'm going to lift it up through my chest, knowing that I want this part of me to open more, right? So then I, I lift the chest even a little bit more. But now, because there's reference on my knees, I'm probably, I know I'm forgetting where my feet are. So I'm going to press down through my feet, even while I'm hitting back on my femur bone, separating my lower abdomen from my, from my waist, my, my sitting bones, my, hitting down with my sitting bones trying to find that space. And then I'm really gonna study the collapse, release. What holes do you fall back into? I can tell you I've got a lot of postural scoliosis. Like I fall back into certain holes, right? Now the holes aren't bad, they're part of me, right? The habits are part of me, right? I'm gonna do it again. I'm going to start to engage. I'm going to learn because I'm trying to figure out how to bring alertness to my boundary so I can integrate the space around me, right? And it turns out that when I get better boundary and I breathe, I introduce movement, I get even more connected. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a miracle there. Right, that I move and ebb and flow with the space around me. Huh. And then I'm going to collapse again and watch the collapse, watch where I settle, watch where my ordinary everyday life brings me into certain patterns. The patterns both give me confidence and they constrain me. Right? So when I'm under a lot of stress, I'll go into my, my known patterns. I'm going to engage again. And this time, I'm really trying to bring the whole world with, go back to your, your, your sinking pattern. As you come into a more of an active position, right? I want you to feel the space around you getting direction from your movement, right? Come on up and in, in and up. Hit down through your sitting bones. Balance your head over your neck. No, figure out what it's like to make something more yogic. Any action. So the whole world's coming with me. I'm going to take a couple of breaths. Good. And then release. Of course. I want you to lift up. I want you to create that lightness in your low back. Because if you don't have space in your low back, your mind gets blocked, right? right? And then I'm setting back down, coming right back to my knees and keeping that more length in my spine to become part of the lift of my chest. And then I'm gonna go back again. Remember all this inward practice to feel more connected to the brush strokes of the pose, right? And then lift the chest. Inhale, take your left arm up. So touch the whole room as you go up with your arm, hit down to the floor with your sitting bones. Don't limit. And as you get through the sitting bones, see if you can't feel more energy coming out your fingertips, right? Don't stop the terminant, your poses at the terminus of your body. Go deeper. So in order for me to have my arm up and hit down through my sitting bones, my abdomen has to narrow some. I have to hit it back. Why? Because I want the space above my fingertips 
to be connected to the space below my sitting bones. Good, and then bring it to the, the outside. So whew, it lands, it crashes, and then I'm gonna take that behind me and I'm gonna to start to initiate an expansion. And as, so slump your shoulders, notice your connection to the space around you. Remember that the lines, the boundary of your poses reveal the space around you. Lift the chest, fill the room. Don't just fill your torso. No, connect the feeling on the inside of your torso to the feeling of the whole room. Now, for me to really do that, I need to not just lift my chest, but ground my sitting bones and feet, right? I want to become active in this space from inside to out. Inhale, lift up, exhale, up. The twist is kind of like, the extra twisting is kind of like the frosting on the cake. I'm moving and directing the inside and outside of me and then release. So now I can feel, I can feel out balance, right? I can feel how I just twisted one direction. I'm just paying attention to what I'm feeling and going like, oh, thank goodness I get to equalize, All right? I get to equalize, right? And so now you're going beyond the fingertips by going down through your sitting bones, down to the floor, narrowing your waist slightly, taking seriously that you're plugging into a river. Because remember, yoga is infinite in every direction at every moment in time. The rivers are going in all directions and my mind cannot process that. But with the help of asana, I can get glimpses of certain rivers. Good, and then exhale and watch the collapse, right, at first, because I had to fall off balance. So I'm gonna ground here. I'm gonna lift my chest and feel the space around me, not just my spine twisting, because I want company. I don't want to feel alone. I want to feel connected. So now I was, oh, in order to feel the whole room, and by the way, I don't feel the whole room when I twist this way as much, right? <clears throat> so I've got work to do. Doesn't mean I have to work the twist harder. It means I have to open more, which in other words, I have to feel the brush strokes. Inhale, lift up, exhale, revolve. Lift under the collarbones, feel the sitting bones, feel the feet. But I'm trying to fill the whole room. Good, and then come on back to center. And so this time, instead of lifting up, I want you to come forward <clears throat> to get the length in your spine, right? <clears throat> to get the lightness of your experience. <clears throat> so when you're leaning forward, there's a tendency to lose the separation between the top of your thighs and your waist. This is gonna happen over and over in yoga poses. Something gets covered up, right? by the movement because your mind makes choices right to pay attention to certain things and those choices are created by your habits so i can tell when i'm forward so i've got a slight rotation in my rib cage was well, not slight you probably do too center yourself as you're leaning forward are you feeling both sits bones equally both feet equally but remember, as I ask you to lift your chest, you're trying to connect to the whole room. You're not just trying to connect and bring precision inside of your body. You're trusting the yogi. So when I have to connect to the whole room, I do have to soften my eyes. I do have to soften the inside of my mouth. I do have to practice pratyahara to be connected. Huh. That's cool. And I'm gonna breathe now a few times, more consciously. Thank goodness I've been breathing the whole time. Good, and then release. <clears throat> so the movement, right? So again, I want you to go out to the side and then shift gravity. So you're watching how things come across your sits bones. Right, so you're going back and forth and you're watching. Because remember, you're trying to stay connected to the whole room, right? As you're moving. 
right? And then of course, because I want this part of all of us to get more integrated with the world, with the world, I want you to come up over the back of your chair and then come forward. So all these practices that we do all the time have a deeper and deeper meaning. If you allow that your poses aren't ending at the terminus of your body, right? And then go off to the side. But the problem with like practicing this way is that some people disassociate, feel the whole room, right? I know that move well. This is how I survived all the trauma when I was 13. I know how to like enter the empty space of the whole room. The struggle for me is staying grounded while I do it. That's why I practice asana, right? And then back and up and over, right? So I can still remember uh, an experience I had when I was in intensive care and then when I was first getting better enough in the hospital in the first three months, depending on go back and forth, I would have this experience that still informs my yoga to this point, depending on who walked through the room and how they were calibrated, the energy inside my body would follow some people more than others, right? You, guys, you know what I'm talking about? You know, and you know how that happens? Holy shit. That's unbelievable, right? That's extraordinary. That means the space between isn't what I thought, right? So now what you're trying to do is get the spaces more so come forward. This time when you come back, take your arm up. Because so one of the things that Austin is trying to get you to do is feel that connection, right? While moving, come forward. Inhale, take your arm up. Because think of all the things we're, at, we're adding now. Come forward, drop on exhalation. Inhale, take the other arm up. Then it starts to get freaking confusing. So if the instructions don't help, don't pay attention to them. Just freaking do it. Forward, back, up. So now, once I got the feeling, now when I'm forward again, I know that when I go, I'm going to go up and back over the back of my chair even more when my arm goes over my head. Right? So I'm going to integrate even more. Oh, and once I do that, where are my heels? Holy crap. Am I touching the whole room with my heel? Right? Good. And then come on back. Our nervous system down and then go up with the other side, go up and over and feel and connect it. Our nervous system is incredible. Right? Good. And then come on back. Now take your knees apart. <laughs> Right, because remember, you're shifting gravity and you're shifting positions, right? Trying to let in more of what surrounds you, right? So I'm going to take here for a second and know my mind gets overwhelmed by the complexity of all that's happening. So I'm going to take some time just to feel this position before I start messing with it. I'm going to try to balance my head over my neck, feel the space on the side of my, between my ears and my shoulders open to what's behind me, get down with my sitting bones. I'm trying to actually be in the new experience. And what's great is that the way to be in, your, in a change is actually to have the brain be passive. Let the information trickle in. Right, and then from this position, with my legs wide, I gotta be more careful I'm going to go up and over the back of my chair. So I'm trying to lift this part of me where someone that knows more than you and me is telling you a lot of our energy is stored right here, right? And I go, when I go to lift though, I have a hard time staying on the edges of my body. I tend to go towards my midline, which is not wrong. You only get to the edges of your rib cage if you can find where your spine is. Right, good, and then come on back, come forward. So this is where I gotta be careful. So I lean forward with my legs wide. I gotta make sure I don't take a digger. So I'm grabbing my foot pedals, right? And I'm coming forward and I'm feeling, can anyone tell they have one groin tighter than the other? Can you see, what, can you feel which one it is? Crap, I'm gonna go back up. 
and I'm gonna like spread my knees again and go, okay, I can tell which groin's a little bit tighter, so I'm gonna be there more, right? When something gets tight, it's because you've abandoned it or overworked it. It's being called, it's being recruited for too much effort, right? And so I'm gonna spread my knees apart and feel that. And I'm gonna lean one direction. I'm gonna hit down and press down with my, my forearm into my leg and be up here and take up more space. I'm twisted a little bit, but I'm doing the things I know. I'm, I want you to spread the space between your shoulder blades, connect it to your sitting bones and connect it to each heel. And then I want you to introduce movement with breath, right? Don't let the pose get static. Then I'm gonna include my chin in my head. And I'm coming out and I'm watching how I come out watching the effect on my eyesight, on my vision, on my breath, right? I'm finding the center again so I can know where my boundary is and then how my brush strokes are continuous with the space around it. And then lean the other way. I can't get this arm as much. I must be I'm way tighter in my right shoulder than I so I might not choose to do this, although I am today, right? But I'm trying to open, ground, hit my sitting bones down, lift my lower abdomen up, right? And start to twist a little bit. But then I have to surrender and let my skin be a brushstroke, like a Matisse drawing, so I can let in the space around me. Good, and then come on back to center. For most of us, and then bring your legs back together. <clears throat> for most of us, it's easier to effort when we're in the community of others. Well, at least most of the time. Okay? So sit up straight and tall again. So I'm going back to where we started. And I'm trying to get the separation. So this is... Already the world I usually fall into is less calling my name. I'm already starting to expand, right? So like the place here, I actually have to force it. The, the asana so far is like inflated the balloon some, right? And so I'm feeling the space and the space in me is more connected to the space outside of me. If I can both feel my boundary and let go of my boundary. The only way to let go of my boundary is to stay grounded with my body, unless you psychologically disassociate. So I'm sitting up straight and tall again. Remember your consciousness has all sorts of tricks. Take your legs apart again. All sorts of tricks for survival. So, Think about one of our big tricks is denial, right? That's how we like, we have to deny, like, can any of us really let in that Russia's on nuclear high alert? Right? I mean, I can have that as a thought. I don't want that thought to enter my body. It's not helpful, right? So I need to know where my boundary is. And my boundary is both tangible and intangible. All right, so lean over to the left. Take the right arm up. So right away, I tend, here's my habit, I tend to fall here. I'm gonna go the opposite to connect to the whole room, right? And go wide. Now I'm gonna do something extra. I'm gonna go back to here to get this part of me connected and bring energy into the world. And the only way I can do that is by hitting my sitting bones down, right? And then figure, oh my God, that the relief of that energy, if I'm listening to it, will actually make me straighten my head because the empty space is part of the alignment. Good, and then release. 
what if yoga does not end at the terminals of your body or yoga poses? Like, it's just so miraculous. Our nervous system, bam, so I'm going to go the other way. So again, I have to allow for each side being so different. And forgive myself for that, actually. Right, and I'm going to go up. Ooh, this is hard. Too much drama in this shoulder, right? So I really have to work on getting my rib cage in, especially the, um, so the, what I'm saying this is that the right side of my rib cage, right? And then I'm letting the connection, the dynamic connection to the whole room be part of it. Let it align me and then come on back to center. Be in the center, bring your legs together. Come lean forward again. So this idea of leaning forward and rising, right? So it's funny because of the way my shoulders are, I'm much more likely to put my, my I'm calling this my right hand and my left hand on my C cushion to come forward and lift my chest. But now I'm gonna do a yoga thing. I'm gonna freaking switch it and it's gonna fry my brain, right? Because this is not what I like, right? Now I'm gonna come forward and lift the other one. And then I'm gonna switch again. Oh, way more natural. My habit pattern, right? Oh, this feels weird. I'm gonna go the other way. So I'm grabbing, coming forward and lifting, right? And then I'm doing it the first way more natural. That must be how I transfer all the time in my life, right? I must go that way. And then I'm going to get, get the other side. Because remember, I want this brush stroke on my side that I'm not as connected to. I want that to fill the world. Okay? So I come forward and I lift up. So this idea, for those of you that are, have trouble standing, right? How do you come forward and lift? For those of us that transfer this energy, really matters. So keep coming forward, lifting up, falling back down. Now do it the other way, which I just don't like. So much yoga to do, right? And then come, you know, and just start to feel. One of the things that I get, I think is unfortunate. So I'm just doing this a few times, right? Is that people that have to sit a lot, especially in wheelchairs, they merge too much with their chairs, right? So I remember I taught a whole class one time at Curve Center. I do this once in a while. This is years and years ago. I said, well, imagine your sitting bones are Mexican jumping bones, right? So like they have movement in them and they like, or they are like, they can pop up and create direction like a popcorn kernel open, right? So I'm gonna come forward, I'm gonna pop up and come back down. Pop up and come on back down. Pop up and come on back down. So I did that my favorite way. Now I'm gonna do it my least, my least, less favorite way and do the same action. And notice that one side, one hand forward, one arm back doesn't work the same as the other. My brain has become overly patterned, right? So I'm just popping up and popping up and thinking that everything can be yoga, right? So one of the things I'm watching my mom, she's 87 and she's, it's getting harder and harder for her to stand up. And so one of the things I can see happening to her is that she's being only thinking, she's being too constrained by where her body ends and the space begins, right? So that when that happens, things get more muscular, right? And she's losing strength at 87. So, so it's like, you know, trying to, so this coming forward and lifting the chest, right? And back and do it again. Make this feel important. It is important, right? Separating from the place you're static, I'm going the other way now, right? Going the other way. 
Because most of the time, I'm telling you to ground down with your sitting bones, right? To touch the floor, right? So sit in the center, right? And now, so when I tell you to hit down through the sitting bones and rise up through the chest, that first space, that's space, that's above the sitting bones hitting down as it begins the lift, right? I want that space, right? So I'm gonna to try to find it by opening up and going back and then really hitting down on my femur bones with my hands, right? And trying to activate the separation, the spatial separation between my legs and my abdomen. Turns out that that space is really important in asana, right? And then come forward and it's gonna get covered up as I come forward, right? So I'm gonna go back again, make that space. Try to keep it in my consciousness as I come forward, right? And in order to keep it, I'm gonna to have to lift my chest as I come forward, get down through my sitting bone keep going deeper into my pose. Mm -hmm. And then back again, finding the space as given. Now, as I come forward, that space has to be earned, right? So what's ironic, and then come back in the center. What's ironic, for me at least, is that in order for me to feel more connected to the space around me, I have to become more conscious of the space between my legs and my lower abdomen, right? That in fact, when I come forward, I lose connection to the whole room, which isn't always bad, forward bends do that, right? But I wanna activate the lift from my sitting bones up through my chest, the downward action of my legs, right? To keep that lit so I can stay more connected to the whole room. Good, and then release. So now try to be a non-yogi and just come forward like you always do. Like collapse in that space and notice right? If you're more or less connected to the whole room. If your brush strokes are in, entering the empty space, right? So come on back to neutral. Come forward again, but stay lit. Stay lit as you come forward. So BK Sangar makes a big deal of forward bends, staying lit, right? Lit's my word. Right? And then I'm going to come down and add a twist. So I'm going to use my forearm and add a twist, right? So, so I'm actually making it more dynamic by introducing change. So I'm forward again. My legs aren't spread, but I'm staying more in my midline. And I'm activating. And then I'm coming back. So this is more like Marie Chiasen 1, if any of you know the, right? So you're coming down. You're trying to stay lit and you're turning, but you're staying lit so the whole room is still part of your pose. And breathe. Good, and then come on back to center. Stretch your arms down. So how would you send, and there's where the words get fun. How would you send more energy without just trying to do it with your mind from the fingertips to the floor? Right? Like, what would you do? So if I just try to push it down, guess what? I've limited my potential. So I'm stretching down my fingertips. What part of me needs to lift in order for me to extend? Right? And obviously I gave you part of the and what part of me needs to hit down to follow the energy of my fingertips 
while maintaining the contrast in the opposite direction. Okay? There's no such thing as a one-way street in life. Ever. And in fact, all poses move in every direction. So although I'm directing more awareness down from my fingertips to the floor, right? In order to do it well, I have to move in every direction. I have to bring my tricep into my humerus or my upper arm bone. I have to lift my sternum. I have to hit down with my sitting bones. I have to extend up through the top of my head to help the energy go down from my fingertips to the floor. Good, and then release. So we're gonna do that all again. And we're gonna try to, step, while you're doing all that effort, you weren't doing effort, then you kind of miss what I'm talking about. But I want you to do it while softening the back of your eyes and softening the inside of your mouth. Okay, so again, arms down by the sides. So we're applying Matisse's drawings, the brush strokes, to the effort, so to go beyond my fingertips, what has to be true. What has to broaden? What has to go down? What has to go up? Now do all that and soften your eyes and soften the inside of your mouth and feel the space between your ears and your shoulders that empty space. Have all this effort in inside of the balance of the whole. Good, and then release. Sit and put your hands. We find symmetry for Shavasana. So right away, because I've been doing this class, I want to Balance my head over my neck as soon as I figure out where I am in space. I'm going to feel my outline in order to let in the support. But I want the support to follow symmetry in my body. And then release and prepare for Shavasana, right? So you know, we, we got a pre preparation for um, right? for you to receive your chair, right? Let the relief travel through you into the empty spaces in your room. Don't direct it. So one of the things that happens in a good Shavasana is you tend to, although you feel your body being supported on the floor, you land your body, you soften your jaw, you relax your organs of perception. You start with structure. And then you lose your body. It's right there.
Feel your breath. Don't change it. Thank your body. Thank what's less tangible. It's less controlled. Start to bring yourself back. Slightly deeper inhalation, slightly longer exhalation. Bringing yourself back. When you're ready, open your eyes slowly and then close them. Boy, it's bright for me today. So I had to close them again and then open. You know, it's funny. You, you know, when Matisse made that the dancer, right? A lot of people have tried to imitate that in different styles and they don't work the same, right? And what's funny about somehow his brush strokes contain movement, even though they're static, right? They're static on the canvas, but they're moving and opening a doorway for our mind to follow into a fuller shape. The thing about, um, I think one of the things that the yogis are trying to pass down about self-realization is that, is that the, the self is contained more in the empty spaces. So you sit in one year opening the door, let's say, even now, by feeling what's around you and where your body is. I remember hearing the line from Gita Angar, a conflicted mind's a knowable mind. A calm mind is unknowable. So you sit and be quiet and don't define yourself by what hurts, what's not happening. That'll take a quieter mind and your boundary will be there and you'll still be able to move beyond your boundary, right? And that's on some level, what's attempted to be communicated. All right, everybody, have a good week. Um, I will see you the next time on here in the Twilight Zone. Hands together, namaste. Spirit in me bows to the spirit in you.